So, stupid Wi-Fi tricks. Because apparently that's what I'm really good at. Or Billy hates the internet, I hate the airwaves. I found this quote the other day, and I really... I think that this probably... Uh, I identify with a lot more than I had ever thought I would, but occasionally you run across things and you sit here and you say, why isn't anybody talking about this? And honestly, I think it's because some people just forget that stuff's out there. Anyway, Wi-Fi bands, uh, 900 megahertz, 2.4 gigs, 5 gigs. Uh, I threw this in here for some strange reason. don't really remember why, but I do feel that I need to tell everybody about Wi Fi. Uh, go to wificlub.org because once you find out about Wi Fi, you have to pass the word along. So, unfortunately, I got drawn into this uh, because I found out about it through somebody's presentation somewhere, and the net result of that is, is that I kind of have to pass it along. Uh, basic idea you have a Faraday cage, which, if you don't know what a Faraday cage is, it's like an elevator. You have a box. It's metal. RF does not escape it. Well, if you put two radios in there, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, whatever, if you throw enough power at the problem, one of them may not survive. Hence the name Wi-Fi. All right, so anyway, we have repeaters. Repeaters repeat around objects. You know, kind of like through walls, mountains, that sort of stuff. Uh, it turns out there's a couple of ways to do this. Uh, one, you can go active where you have to put you know, power in a location. Uh, sometimes this is impractical because that location may be you know, in the middle of a 90-mile path. It may be at the top of a mountain. Uh, it may be down in a valley. There's no telling. It depends on exactly what you're trying to do. And, of course, we've got passive repeaters, which are simply other ways to repeat signals that are a bit more difficult. Uh, your link margins are much, much tighter. Uh, not, a way, not a very good way to go. Uh, active repeaters, there's about three different ways to do this. Uh, you can always go with WDS. Uh, but with WDS, you're using the same channel. So you're going to be impacted, you know, at least about oh, uh, the wireless distribution system. Uh, Wikipedia is your friend. It's a, a common feature for a lot of uh, access points these days, uh, at least on the enterprise level. I'm trying to remember. I think it showed up somewhere around when Apple introduced the airport so that you could take and buy one airport, plug a network card into it, and then you could buy another airport and have it repeat off of the first airport. Uh, but the problem, again, is, is that they're all using the same channel, so your total bandwidth gets affected by how many access points you have chained together because one of them hears the other one and can't transmit at the same time it's receiving. So that's that's a problem that's so old in, in uh, radio over or uh, data over airwaves that it's people are still playing with it to this day. Well, an alternative, of course, is to go dual radio where you listen on one channel and you transmit on another. Uh, the only problem with this is, is that, uh, well, you kind of waste two channels. You also have to be very careful about how you implement it exactly because you need to separate your antennas by a certain amount. And you need to keep in mind that you have two radios here. They, they can't hear each other. Uh, in the bad old days of, well, there cert certain vendors had access points that were a pair of Orinoco cards stuck right side by side each other. The problem with the Orinoco card is is that there was no way to turn off the internal uh, antenna. You could plug a pigtail into it, but you could not shut off that internal antenna. So if you had two radio cards sitting right beside each other, they would hear each other to some extent. Um, of course, this means that you know it's it's not a perfect solution. I ran across this concept a little while back, um, the O car and. I really like the idea. Really like the idea. An OCAR is an on-channel active repeater. Very simple implementation. You've got a low noise amplifier, which is basically a preamp. A filter to 
filter out and make sure that you're amplifying exactly what bandwidth you want to be amplifying. Intermediate amplifier, of course. And finally, you chase that with a power amplifier. And here's an image that I gratuitously stole from someone else's website. This is the basic implementation of an OCAR. You have a receive antenna, you have a transmit antenna, the preamp, the filter, the amplifier. The reality of this is if you're going to use an OCAR, there are probably going to be just a few more amplification stages involved in this simplistic diagram. The other thing you have to keep in mind is, is that you really have got to separate the antennas. And you cannot get away with just using cheap, you know, run-of-the-mill coax on this. You have to go with hardline. If you're playing at 5.8 gigahertz or up, you may be able to get your hands on some elliptical waveguide. That would definitely be the way to go. The only problem is, is that right now, elliptical waveguide, if there's a roll of it laying somewhere and somebody notices it, it will disappear because it's mostly copper. And, of course, the copper prices are, are high enough that they will shoot at you if they are trying to pick it up and you want to keep it. Okay, the uh, gentleman asked if uh, this, the OCAR is using the same channel. Do you see a receiver anywhere in here, a transmitter anywhere in here? That's kind of the point of this thing is, is that it's a very, very dumb box. What, what keeps it from, uh, from looping back on itself? Um, that's actually another part that you have to implement, which is automatic gain control. Uh, that is the sad part about the OCAR, and that is one of its, its chief cons is, is that it can loop up on itself. Uh, you have to specifically avoid that, keep it from happening, because a ringing amplifier is a problem. Um, you know, there's been hundreds of FCC complaints that were traced back to a ringing amplifier in somebody's active antenna, you know, for cable. Not for cable. You don't pick up cable with an antenna. If you do pick up cable with an antenna, please call somebody because that means the leakage is entirely too high. All right, so anyway, um, you can also use two antennas. Well, you've got two antenna types, which are directional, omnidirectional. Of course, omnidirectional radiates in all directions. Uh, the big thing here, again, antenna separation is the result, is, is key. All right, so we've got one Wi-Fi channel repeated in one Wi-Fi channel. This is mostly set by the filter bandwidth. The con to this puppy is, is that noise is also repeated. The, the other issue is, is that you're dealing with the math is almost identical to a passive repeater. Because you have, on the one hand, you are receiving a signal, so you have a, a certain amount of path loss between your antenna and that other antenna that you're trying to receive from. However, you can put at least 80 dB worth of gain in this OCAR and, you know, overcome some of your path loss on the other side. If I were implementing this, I would use an extremely large dish on the other end just to make sure I have as much signal as possible pointed at me. The pro here is, is that, obviously, anything that is, fits within the filter bandwidth is repeated. Anything, video, Wi-Fi, cordless phone, Zigbee, RFID. So, yeah, this, this goes a little bit further than just, oh, look, I can repeat a, a, a Wi-Fi signal. This is, well, I can put one of these puppies up on a roof, and I can kind of do whatever I want with it. So, like I said... You really don't think too much when you're doing a physical site survey, especially when you're talking about Wi-Fi. You pop up on the rooftop, you look around, and you look and you see, do I have any antennas that are pointed at me? Or, you know, that are pointed in my general direction that are going to cause me trouble down the road. And usually that's not an issue. But nine times out of ten, you're not going to notice that tiny little 6 dBi, 2.4 gigahertz patch that's bolted to the side of the building that's spray-painted red to match the color of the building. 
And if that happens to be the antenna that's looking at you, you really don't notice the fact that there's a 10-foot dish pointed the other way because it's not pointed at you. The tiny little one is. So you definitely need to be aware of exactly which way that dish does point and try to keep this in mind. Of course, you can also take this a little bit further because it does extend range, which will allow you to do interesting things. You know, breaking web is one thing. Um, this basically allows you to, you know, continue repeating the signal for as far as it takes. You know, until you get to a safe place where you have that, you know, 200 node cluster sitting in the basement, the stack of Dell servers that the Dell salesman still calls you up and says, will you please buy some more? You know, where you're cracking web keys in real time or close to it, or perhaps that's just where you keep all your FPGAs in the basement. So anyway, yeah, this is uh, this is something to think about. I mean, the other problem is too here is is that you can deal with uh, multiple O cars, directional antennas. Obviously, you know, very high gain antennas. That's that's my preference because that's what I really like is high gain antennas. I love large antennas. <laughs> but the other part here is too is is that it's it's kind of one of the it, these issues where you can chain these things up. There's no reason why you can't set an O-car up on top of someone's roof and bounce the signal and then keep going, set up another one, because all you're doing is, is at each successive stage, you pick up whatever the sight noise is. This is why I also suggest using large antennas. Large antennas, you can find, you can find what you're going to pick up because it's pointed in a particular location. There are some realistic limits to this. If you get an antenna that's too large, you're going to pick up just a tiny, tiny little patch of a signal. Um, but the benefit there is, is that if you have another antenna pointed at it, that you're going to make sure that you actually repeat, or you know, that you're able to receive that signal and get it somewhere else. But again, you know, there's no reason why you couldn't uh, take this to the point of having, you know, three O cars over 40 miles or something to get the signal out into the country. Uh, a couple of years back, I wrote a presentation, and I mentioned something about passive repeaters, of course. Passive repeaters have twice the pass loss. So this is another factor you're still dealing with here. The difference is, is that in the middle... Somewhere around that uh, plus 23, minus 1, plus 23, 23 dBi, uh, 23 dBi dishes, uh, you input about, like, plus 80 there. So that, that helps. But anyway, um, all right, I need to pop out here. Now comes the really fun part. Okay. Um, where are we at? So, yeah. We have OCARS, which essentially is a, a non-inverting, non-anything translator, or excuse me, transponder. Transponder is a uh, concept from satellite where we basically put a broadband amplifier much like this, only you can actually push things off frequency slightly with them. For instance, uh, with the OCAR, it's actually very simple. If your target is receiving, or if you're receiving your target on channel one, and you want to, you know, move that signal, say, to channel 6, channel 11, you mix in, you, you know, build a mixer or something. You can probably go Google this stuff. Um, but you can get a mixer relatively easy. You inject 22 megahertz or 44 megahertz, and you can move that signal up a channel or two. It's entirely possible if you have a license for MMDS that you could move in the signal into that band. The FCC will not be happy with you, however, because they really don't like it when you change from one service to another. All right. Um, so, yeah, you can, you can do one thing or another here. You can uh, move the signal about. The way that I stumbled across this was as I was looking at a very very tall location that has extremely good line of sight to everywhere within about 60 miles. And trying to figure out how in the world 
I would try to repeat a signal off of that thing. One of the problems is, is that when you're dealing with an object that high in the air, is that service calls tend to be a bit on the expensive side. So you have to look for something that is extremely cheap or stupid. And that, that's exactly where this works. So for instance, you could place an OCAR. Well, actually, I was looking at doing a, a linear transponder. But you could place one of these things way up in the air with the appropriate amount of antenna separation, uh, which I believe is somewhere on the order of about 100 wavelengths or so. But I don't remember. The first example I saw was done at, uh, at 10 gigahertz. And I should probably pull that URL up or at least do something about that. So yeah, there's the URL for you, if you can read it. Um, basically, just uh, Google OCAR. I think I've probably put that phrase into Google enough that uh, it should pop up fairly soon. Um, and you can read a lot more about this. The practical implementation of this puppy is is that uh, I could not <laughs> get my stuff together to to build one, but you can get some uh, probably some FR4 uh, fiberglass board and a, a couple of uh, small MMICs that work at, uh, at microwave frequencies and amplify it that way. Um, I haven't figured out exactly the best way to do ALC. Typically, if you are... If you're careful enough that you don't have a reflective object in the middle of the path, um, you know, like an airplane or something like that, some object, you know, set this thing up next to the road and you start picking up, uh, you have a, a truck drive across in front of you, then you're probably going to, you're probably going to have the, the thing repeat on itself. There's not a whole lot you can do about that. Uh, you just want to try and avoid them. That's one of the other reasons why you put these things, you know, preferably in tall locations that they can't be accessed very quickly, uh, simply because it limits the amount of trouble you're going to have. Again, this is the, the uh, figure here. Let's see. We have another building user. Okay, where is? But yeah, so it, like I said, it, it will repeat. Uh, it will repeat video. It will repeat anything. I was looking at this because I started out saying I want to repeat an FM signal, five kilohertz uh, modulation, FM. And then I said, well, if I'm going to put up a voice, if I'm going to go through the trouble of, you know, engineering, sitting down, figuring out how I'm going to, re you know, repeat a signal that's a voice bandwidth wide, I want data because, well, I'm a geek. I've got to have data. And one thing led to another. The next thing I know, I'm staring at this puppy. Okay. Um, the other interesting part about this is is that I don't believe there's any precedent for exactly what this little thing is. Um, I don't think the FCC said you can't do it. I don't think they said you can. So this is kind of untested water. It is. It's not exactly a linear transponder. It's not exactly a lot of anything. It it is what it is. And so that is another point here is is that I think that. At least until Monday, you can probably play with this. <laughs> but then again, that's one of the reasons why I'm giving this talk is because I found this. I, I said, you know what? This, this is really interesting stuff. I want to get it out here. So we have an OCAR. There is another way to do uh, passive repeaters. When you're doing passive repeaters, of course, you've got you know, two antennas, blah, blah, blah. They're you know, one point at another. But there are actually some passive repeaters that work. There's a very old concept called a fly swatter antenna. And the fly swatter antenna was very commonly used by telephone companies for years because it allowed them to put the dish at the ground level where the technician can get to it. And at the top of the tower, they just put a plain reflector. Uh, typically, this thing was, you know, like 10 feet by 10 feet because the dish at the bottom was at least 6 foot in diameter. But 
the problem with the flash water antenna is is that you have to keep that reflective surface it has to be aligned and on top of that you have to keep it from twisting in any way so you wind up well you have to usually have a very big tower that wasn't a problem for telco they built big towers all the time matter of fact some of their flash waters were the smaller towers that is one type of passive repeater that works. And the reason why it works is because typically the first hop is relatively short, you know, 30 feet or so, so you don't have nearly quite so much of an impact in the uh, antenna gain, the path loss of the, the overall uh, link. Uh, AT&T was very good about this. I spoke with a longliner after giving uh, one of my previous presentations, and... He told me that they built a building in the middle of one of AT&T's wireless shots back probably around the 70s when they were still using long lines. And this is exactly what AT&T did to get around the problem. They contacted the owners of the building and they put flash water reflectors on the building, you know, these large flat reflectors. I think they actually had, they were some form of metal screen but they were able to bounce the signal completely around the building and continue the path as they had been doing for years. Another form of passive reflector, if you start, if you start digging into passive reflectors, you'll, you'll find these little bits and pieces all over the place because Telco had the money to make it happen. Somebody in California actually decided to try and build a telephone company by setting up a lot of passive reflectors and just putting dishes at each end and bouncing off of that reflector out in the middle of the desert. I don't know what their quality of service was, but I'm willing to bet that uh, it may not have quite been what they were hoping for. But that is another idea, too. You see a billboard, think of it as a reflective surface. If it's metal, then you should be able to bounce a signal off of it. Another thing that I don't think a lot of people think about is, is that when you're dealing with RF, think about a ringing bell. Keep in mind that when that thing gets tapped, you know, the signals reverberate. The signals, you know, they bounce off of other objects. When you, you put up a, a TV antenna and you start seeing ghosting, other weird effects, you really, don't, you really don't sit back and think about, you know, what it is that's causing that to happen. But what you're actually seeing is a, a visual representation of radar. That ghosting may actually be 40 trailers located a mile away that that signal is bouncing off of between and so on. And you're seeing the cumulative effects of all those changes in phase. Okay. Parabolic antennas. Parabolic antennas are a favorite subject of mine. Uh, you can go with simple parabolics. You can do... Um, Cylindrical reflectors. Cylindrical reflectors are probably much, much easier way to go. But one of the one of the, the things about uh, cylindrical reflectors is is that they're well just the same as a parabolic. You really don't need if you want to, you can sit down, you can, you know, do math equations, you can come up with, you know, well, this is exactly how we should put it. This is where you know, point A is, point B, and all the rest of that. Well, you can just grab a marker and a pen and make a parabolic out of anything. That kind of is the strength here because you can sit down with your marker and your pen and you can, you know, put that point there. Well, that point is your focus. That's where all the energy is going to wind up at. You put your antenna there, you know. Or, in some cases, what's really neat, interesting, and fun about uh, like things like the Wi-Fi shootout is, is that we have radios that are so small that you can just put the whole damn thing at the focus of the antenna. At 2.4 gigahertz, there's no problem doing that. You just run a USB cable to the, to the, uh, to the dish, and you know your radio is that tiny little chunk in the middle. As a matter of fact, that's a common concept that uh, Canopy has embraced. You can, you know, they, they only make one radio module, but you can slide that little puppy in, into the focus of uh, what looks like a DSS dish, and, you know, magically now you've got more gain. Well, you could do the same thing, too. You can drop that thing into the focus of a 10-foot dish, and, you know, now you've got canopy with 30 plus dB. Uh, the cylindrical reflector, parabolics and cylindrical reflectors are both 
both closely related. Uh, true parabolic is obviously it's it's going to have some depth to it. Uh, there are there are formulas. I have them somewhere. I I think they may be in another presentation. But you can basically figure out exactly how large the dish has to be and how deep. One of the things I looked at for doing the Wi-Fi shootout would be how can I economically make a reflected antenna, or make an antenna reflector, rather, and keep my feed point in a manageable place? And it turns out one of the ways to do this is using an offset... Uh, what the thing's called. Anyway, if you've seen a DSS dish, you know that you have a very odd shape. You know, you, you look at it, you don't really know exactly which way it's pointing because the focus is down here and the reflector's up here. But it turns out that that's exactly half of a parabolic arc. So if you do the other half of it, then, then you see it very simply. Well, if you do the same thing, but you're working with a structure that's only, say, two feet deep, and you've got that nice arc, and it's, say, 12 feet tall, your focus can actually be engineered so that it's 50 feet out. So now, in order to use the antenna, you just go stand down range, you know, with whatever you need, whatever you want, and anything that fits that bandwidth of how wide the antenna, or the reflector, rather, is, will be repeated. The reason why I looked at this is because a lot of the coordination for the Wi-Fi shootout was done at uh, 144 megahertz and uh, 400, uh, 440 megahertz. And obviously, if you've got all this antenna gain, you really don't want to be confined to just you know one antenna. The, the parabolic will reflect anything, including audio, too. Let's see. Um But yeah, that was that was one uh, one idea I had. Another idea was uh, you can take a you can build a stacked antenna, uh, like a, you can take a collinear and you can put a cylindrical reflector behind it, and you know the exact same effect. You can you can build a collinear out of uh, coax sections. You cut them up, you solder them together. Now you've got you know an eight dBi antenna or so. You well you place a plane reflector behind it and you can. Well, now you can pick up your neighbor's Wi-Fi. You put a cylindrical reflector behind it, and now you've got, you know, like an 18-degree sector, and you can pick up somebody else's Wi-Fi down the road. Let's see. What else have we got in here? Another thing that I've noted that the FCC recently change their rules for is is that there's a concept out here called a uh, hybrid combiner. When we start looking at those puppies, it makes life a, a little interesting, too. There aren't very many of these that are in use, mostly because they are hideously complicated devices. Not really. They're just expensive if you actually buy them. If you buy them off of eBay or if you build them, they're a whole lot cheaper. But specifically, the FCC changed the verbiage so that you can't just go and combine all three transmitters for all three bands into one common antenna and then completely pollute the airwaves. Obviously, if you show up in one place, you take all three channels, your neighbor wireless ISP has nothing. Let's see. Let's see the the other, another, another interesting factor here is um, you can do a lot with antenna polarizations. Uh, typically, you start out with you know one polarization, vertical, horizontal. Horizontal is actually best if you're doing a long distance shot because of the way the multipath from the terrain will will kind of nullify itself. But in the cellular industry, they've been using a 45 degree slant polarization, and one of the theories behind the reason why they stuck with that odd angle is because when most people get on the cell phone, the bloody thing sits at a 45-degree angle. But again, that's just a theory. Supposedly, the benefit of a 45-degree slant polarization is that it's not vertical, it's not horizontal, and your cross-polarization loss is not nearly as bad 
you know, going from vertical to horizontal, I'm trying to remember, I think it's a, a, almost like uh, 20 dB or so. Whereas if you're using circular polarization, you lose 6 dB. Well, at 45 degrees, you don't lose nearly quite so much as one or the other. But you can also, if you're looking at scanning, you can take advantage of that fact, and now you can deploy, you know, several vertical antennas at the same time as you're also deploying several horizontal ones and so on and so forth until you can basically come up with a Christmas tree that you can walk into a place and you can say, well, I'm listening to all channels at the same time. I just wanted to build one of these things, but, well, 11 USB radios is a little on the expensive side. Not to mention you've still got to actually get enough bandwidth back into the device for, you know, if you're, if you're looking at... Uh, at, at 54 megabit wireless, then obviously you're going to have to trunk all that bandwidth back into the computer some way. So you've got to really sit down and think things through if you want to monitor more than just, you know, one channel at a given time. You've got two USB ports, so on and so forth. But when you really start talking about covering the entire band, I can tell you based off of some, some simple research I did, I think channel 2 and channel 6 are probably the most used channels which didn't really make a whole lot of sense to me because channel 2 is not at the bottom of the band, but at the same time, channel 1 is available, I think, everywhere in the world. Let's see what else we've got. Well, I, I don't know if anybody else saw me last night, but... Um, I I got a little a little busy and uh, I wasn't quite able to compile everything ahead of time. So I've got an outline here. I'll build the rest of the talk. I'll put it online. You can download it. I've said this before. Don't count on anything. But yeah, definitely. By all means, if, if you can actually see that URL, I, I would recommend you go ahead and, and start checking that out. Uh, the OCAR I think is is the way to go if you're building a repeater, um, or at least if you really want to experiment with some interesting stuff. Now, wait a minute. You're already drunk? Aren't you? St oh, you're still, you're still drunk. You're not missing much. As long as this talk's been recorded, I'm, I'm sure you'll be able to, you know, pick it up off the web somewhere. I mean, that's half the benefit of being here. It's like, oh, look, it's all recorded. Well, I'll just go download it later because I'm missing half the con anyway. Okay. Um, another, another typical implementation for a passive reflector is what they used to use in uh, the bad old uh, days, you know, when, when people actually used to watch that, that, that thing they call TV. You know, they put up an antenna and they'd point it in a direction and they'd kind of look at whatever they, they had available there. But for the people who live down in valleys, like in places like Kentucky, where you've actually got some mountains in the way, some ridges, that signal does not get down into the valley. So what they would do would be, depending on who, depending on how the TV station felt about it, depending on, you know, how the people felt about it, cable systems, that sort of stuff, they might go up on top of that mountain and they would put a pair of antennas back to back, a pair of Yaggies, you know, just a cable between them. And that's sort of where this concept evolved from was is that somebody did this and they actually put an amplifier in the middle and they engineered it, and they said, well, we're just going to add about, you know, 3 or 6 dB in the middle, maybe 10 dB. And the signal was good enough that that cable system could continue feeding. And they didn't have nearly so much issue with signal quality as they did because AM is terribly inefficient. And the new digital stuff is um, they're packing more bits in there per hertz than, well, it makes my head hurt. Okay, another idea that I had, which I wrote into the talk, which unfortunately, as I said, I couldn't get my shit together, would be to demonstrate an antenna made of jello. Now I have your attention again. But again, I didn't get that together. 
So I'll just basically explain the process and some of the thoughts that went on behind this thing. The antenna isn't really made of jello so much as it is supported by jello. You take an end connector or a BNC connector, you solder two wires to it so that you have them coming up. You need to punch a hole in the jello using something, you know, some kind of a yeah, there you go. A spoon. I would look for a cylindrical object because I'm just kind of an RF purist. Straw would uh, straw is, is not a bad idea, but you you probably want to be, I'd say about three eighths of an inch in diameter or so. But yeah. So anyway, you punch a hole in this thing uh, so that you've got the wires feeding through. You turn them out so that they're sideways and almost touching the surface of the jello, and then you lay down a track of like iron filings or iron powder on either side. The powder should be conductive through the fact that it's just powder. But the important part here is to remember that the surface, what everything's sitting on, is a resistive medium. At 2.4 gigahertz, water absorbs RF. And that's exactly what frequency you're working at here. So, one, in order to prove that the antenna actually works, you need to kind of have it on plastic or wood or something. And then, you, of course, you've got your, your layer of jello and then the antenna itself. But if you try to hold this thing up sideways, you're not going to hear anything behind it because there's no RF that's actually making it from the surface backwards. Because, essentially, you have attached it to a very large absorbing medium at 2.4 gigahertz. So, I think that that theory would work on a number of other frequencies. Uh, 5 gigahertz may be a much better by yeah much better place to play with this simply because you don't have nearly as much absorption at uh, at 5 gigs as you would at 2.4 gigs. 2.4 gigs, it's just going to, you know, nothing is going to escape. It's going to be a black hole of RF. I mean, you know, you've got so much suspended water there that, well, I, I wouldn't bet on, on receiving anything behind it. Now, that is an added benefit too, though, because you won't be picking up any noise behind the antenna. But, of course, you know, uh, I also wouldn't try to use this for transmitting anything other than Wi-Fi because with Wi-Fi, you're dealing with such low power that, you know, you don't have to worry about things catching fire and setting, you know, trying to set Jello on fire <laughs> or, or attempt to make slag on top of Jello, which would probably not be a very nice sandwich. Mm-hmm. That is correct. That That is one issue you have to deal with is, is that you, if you do try to attempt to place the antenna anything close to uh, to vertical, you are going to have the material fall off. And the jello, of course, is not a very, a very sound structural medium. Well, the... The idea wasn't necessarily so much as a uh, as, as having a yeah functional. It, w it wasn't designed to be a functional antenna. It was kind of one of these things of like, what's the craziest idea I can come up with in the world that nobody's attempted with an antenna yet? And it's, uh, I mean, this is this is a, a, a perfectly. I don't, I don't know. I, I thought about it and I said, you know, this is probably going to be a lot more interesting to science teachers than it will be to hackers than it will be to, you know, hams, anybody playing with radio. So, but yeah, definitely I wouldn't use Jello as a structural medium by any stretch. It's just kind of one of these things of, uh, you know, it, on the one hand, it also absorbs RF. Um, so there's probably, there's probably a body of work for this. Oh, absolutely. Well, you, yeah, I suppose a sponge would work, but well, yeah. But one of the, one of the specific reasons why I looked at Jello is is that the surface of Jello tends to be extremely flat. If you were using a sponge, you'd have the iron filings falling into the sponge, and well, that would work. I mean, I'd almost say to freeze it first. If if you freeze it, then you've got a flat surface of Jello. As long as you don't move it around too much, you know, it's not going to absorb the iron filings. The iron filings aren't going to fall into it. Um, if that's kind of the other issue here too, is if you sit down, and you fundamentally look at at how an antenna is is built and made. 
when you start moving it under the surface of water, it really changes how it behaves an awful lot. It tends to get very inefficient. And the other thing, too, is is that uh, when you move the antenna below the surface of water, it it's affected very strangely. Diffraction... It does something else altogether. You wind up, you can you can put a, a helical underwater. Uh, John Krauss actually tested this, and the the uh, the pattern coming out of that thing may only be you know V-shaped, very narrow. When it hits the surface of the water, it immediately spreads into a fan shape. So that tends to be a little difficult to deal with. Uh, the other problem is too is is that hey you know we're working. <laughs> We're trying to build an antenna on top of a resistive medium, so that tends to be a little a little strange in and of itself. Yeah, I suppose you could do that. You you could attempt to freeze the jello to make it harder. Um, you could probably. Okay. Or you could drop it in a liquid nitrogen. And a block of ice would work as well, but I, I figured, you know, the, the, the novelty approach was, was mostly the idea here. Um, if you are interested in antennas, there are a few books that I would highly recommend you get your hands on. Uh, your local technical or university library probably has them. Uh, one of them is Antennas by John Krauss. Uh, John spent so much time in antennas, he was playing with them in the 1920s. He expired a couple of years back. Um, but John was a, a very brilliant man in, in terms of, of antennas. And it's... I think shouldn't have gone to sleep. Anyway. Um, so John really knew what he was doing on, on many levels. He, uh, he was a professor, a doctor in some form or another at Ohio State. He was the gentleman behind the Big Ear Project. Another book that has been very useful to me was uh, the Antenna Engineering Handbook. It's written by uh, Johnson and Jasik. That's J-A-S-I-K. And again, these are these are fairly high-level texts. I should I should mention that I've been in ham radio for about 13 years, so. For me, it's, it kind of started out as, you know, just playing with radios. And eventually, at some point, I started looking at antennas because <clears throat> one, of, one of the issues with data is that you have a certain number of bits per hertz. And there's only so many ways to get those bits through there. And you really don't think about how much energy there is in a given spectrum until you start looking at things like a Wi-Fi card at 32 milliwatts is transmitting a signal that is 11 megahertz wide or potentially wider in the case of 802.11n. When you start looking at the actual, the actual you know, energy per hertz there and you start looking at amplifying that, you, you realize that if you had a narrower signal, you would need a lot less power. Uh, I'm trying to remember, I sat down and figured this up once, but you wind up with something along the lines of, um, what was it? I think I was looking at a signal on 900 megs. Hold on a second. <coughs> Excuse me. M anyway, you look at something like, I think I was looking at about 100 kilohertz. Just I just pulled, well, when you're working with data, occasionally your your rates look like frequencies and, and vice versa. But at 100 kilohertz, let's say you have a one watt signal and it's it's going a, a distance, whatever, it doesn't really matter. But you have you know that hundred, they have that one watt that's spread out over that 100 kilohertz. And when you compare that against a two way radio that is spreading out, you know. 5 watts at 5 kilohertz, you see that there's obviously a bit more energy there. I worked this back as something along the lines of, um, I think I was looking at 5 watts for 100 kilohertz. 
And that winds up being equivalent to like 100 watts at 5 kilohertz. So you can see here that, you know, amplifying signals is not really as easy as it looks. Yes, you can go buy an amplifier and do this, that, or the other. But the reality is is that you've got an awful lot of, of information there that's, that's being amplified. And because of that, you often have to go the antenna route because power is not always an option. Sometimes you can't get amplifiers that that can do this stuff on a budget. Uh, you know, you may be lucky to find an amplifier on eBay that will do it, but again, that's kind of an FCC issue. There are some things you can do with certain organizations that you can't do with others. Do we have any? Uh, go ahead. Okay, the, the question here is, is that how much does uh, humidity and, and water vapor in the air affect uh, signal the path loss at, at the Wi-Fi bands? Well, at 2.4 gigahertz anyway. It does. It's, it's actually appreciable. Um, if you had some form of, you know, tornadic weather, your Wi-Fi link would go down. If, if you had enough water in the air, if you were trying to point uh, through a hurricane... <laughs> You know, hurricane blows in, there's a large mass of water in the air. That that could, you know, af affect a, a, uh, a link between land and uh, and an island. But they usually try to work around that with undersea fiber and uh, and satellite. You may see that uh, yeah, on a misty day or something like that, probably not so much. Fog, I think you would. It's usually when you can actually see the water vapor in the air, it affects it. Um, but again, we're not talking about, you know, something where the link will go down unless you have a very, very low fade margin to begin with. That's one of the reasons why they build fade margins the way they do. You make sure that you have, you know, at least 30 dB and you can say, I think you're close to 5.9's reliability. And one of the reasons for that is, is because, you know, atmospheric conditions do change. Um, Usually what gets rid of uh, Wi-Fi links that somebody's put in place is uh, either physical, somebody climbs the tower and strips the antenna off, or it gets blown off, which is a, a very common issue. When you have, you know, an antenna stuck up on a TV tower and, you know, the storm of all storms blows through and blows the radar off the tower at 120 miles an hour, you know, you're going to lose a, a, another couple of antennas along the way. That kind of happens. That's why they build, you know, TV towers so that they don't really ever come down. Except, of course, in cases of um, human intervention, airplanes and people doing stupid things with guy wires or just trying to upgrade towers where they put, you know, you exceed its, its vertical limits or, uh, well, typically tower overweight is not an issue. You don't really think about it, but when you have a 2,000-foot tower that's covered in six inches of, uh, of ice, it's carrying well over 100,000 pounds, and that 20,000 pound or that 4,000 pound antenna at the top really doesn't look quite so heavy anymore. But yeah, so you you know there there are a number of factors here. Uh, at some, I think around 60 something gigahertz, oxygen actually affects path loss. So there's there's an oxygen line there as well where oxygen uh, absorbs RF. It doesn't. Uh, it's not so much a a, uh, a sort of a resonance issue. It doesn't resonate. It just absorbs it. So there's there's various bits and, and pieces of spectra all over the place that the FCC, you know, for whatever reason, people found out about this stuff through academic experimentation, and they said, well, oxygen does this, and water does this, and the other. Well, anybody who wanted to commercially use RF saw these studies and they said, we don't want those frequencies. And as time evolved, those were just what was left over. And, you know, when Wi-Fi came along, they said, well, you know, this is, it's unlicensed, so, you know, we're not going to be policing it. And, you know, again, you know, water attenuates uh, at 2.4 gigahertz, so it's it kind of, it kind of, solves the problem a bit. 
if you talk to some of your really committed war drivers, get them talking about rain, driving around in the rain, because there are two thoughts there. One is, is that at 2.4 gigahertz, you know, the rain hitting all over the place is, is going to attenuate your noise in addition to attenuating other signals. So the signals that you do receive should have substantially less noise, you know, from the, the nearby environment. Do we have any other questions? Go ahead. Really and honestly, uh, for this sort of stuff, I recommend building my own, or building your own, rather, because it is terribly cheap. You know, you can go, to, you can go out and you can download the instructions on how to build a can antenna or any number of antennas off of the Internet. Uh, it's very... Okay, that, that's another very good point, uh, the difference between uh, a directional antenna for war driving or an omnidirectional antenna. My preference is omnidirectional. Uh, you could do a cantenna, but a cantenna, uh, a directional antenna would be best used in a single place because you can, you know, put a tripod and you can spin around and you pick things up. The problem with that, and we did actually experiment with this. I drove to the top of a ridge with my car when I had an antenna on it for Wi-Fi. The problem is is that when you when you go to a ridge top and you fire up Net Stumbler and you've got the GPS there and you spin around, you record all these access points. NetStumbler records where the GPS says it's at. It doesn't really record what direction you're pointed in. And the other factor there, too, is that you have to consider your antenna game. Um, something else I forgot to mention here. When you're dealing with cylindrical reflectors, one of the really nice parts about a cylindrical reflector is that in one of its dimensions, it doesn't care. So you can build a high-gain antenna, something around like, 30-something dB worth of gain, 36. Uh, one of the antennas I, I actually built in, in the driveway was uh, 10 feet wide. And it was only about, uh, it was 10 feet by 3 feet. And I think the focus was out about like 16 inches or so. But you could take this thing out into the desert and you can put it in, in one direction and you can kind of say, you know, I have a GPS, I get a location from the other guy, and I know that he's out there like 150 miles downrange, you know, using a satellite phone or something. Well, I know exactly where he's at in terms of uh, my azimuth, which direction, you know, around I need to point it, but I don't know where he's at in terms of elevation. Well, I can flip the antenna on its side, and that doesn't matter anymore. So a cylindrical reflector is also very good for hunting signals, Okay, do we have any other questions? Really quick. No questions, excellent. All right, sorry to keep everyone so long. I'd actually hope to, to make this presentation a little more interesting, but I always tend to go way off on the technical side of things. Uh, one bit of wisdom I would like to leave everyone with is if you're seriously thinking about antennas, start thinking about them in terms of degrees of phase. Uh, I think that was probably the largest uh, bit of information that kind of helped me try to understand some of it. Thank you very much for your time, and I'm sorry I bored everyone to death.